In front of your bulletin, you'll see a church. That was Glenville Old School. That was back in 1960s that that church was built. And the church was established in 1956. And through that establishment of a church in 1956, hundreds and thousands of people have given their life to Christ. And many millions of dollars have been given through this church to different mission organizations and missionaries. And as we look at probably the last 58 years, June 3rd, which is Tuesday, is going to be our 58th birthday for Glenville Bible Baptist Church. It was started as Ridgecrest Baptist Church and in one of the local schools. And then it moved into a, into a garage, and then it's had a few different homes. But it came resting in this place back in about 1960-something. And when it came to this place, it started a lighthouse, I believe, in this side of Wichita. That I believe back from 1956 to the year 2014, there was a purpose and a plan for Glenville Baptist Church. I believe that plan was to be a lighthouse and to be able to communicate the truth of God's word. Not only for the people that come through these doors, but for the people in our community. What did we learn? What did God give to us that was so important that has tested, has been tried, and has came out faithful in the word of God, in the teaching of God, in the trials of the church? There's not a big difference in this church or any other church when it comes to testings and to trials. But somehow, God has always allowed this church, his hand upon this church, to go through those trials and to come out on the other side. Tom Rayner, he's the statistician for Christian Health, he, he wrote a book on the phase of a church that has gone over 50 years. So a 50-year-old church, there's a lot of things that have taken place within the church, and the average church that has been in existence for over 50 years is almost non-existent. If you would remember that 80% of all churches, all churches in North America have either stagnated or declined over the last 15 years. 80%. North America is the only major continent that Christianity is on a decline. In all other countries, Christianity is on the upswing. Now, there may be more Christians here, but in population, we are losing the foothold of Christianity in our churches, not because of the world. It's our fault. We are the church that are supposed to go into the world, bringing them into the church, bringing them into Christ. So if 80% of all churches are stagnated and declining. We, the church, we have to make a decision. What are we going to do? Can we play the ostrich, stick our head in the sand, and hope, I hope the next generation is going to fix it. I hope God supernaturally does something and changes everybody's opinion. No, our church must go and see what is it that we did when we started and we were successful. Methodology, it may be different. Doctrinal, it'll be same. But we have to have a style and we have to have an approach that we're going to be able to get into lives, change them, and to be radically different for the cause of Jesus Christ. Now, every one of us would say, absolutely, we should go get them and bring them into this church. They should become like us and our church would grow. Amen, everybody would say that. But here's the difference. What we have to do is we have to love them enough that they will follow you back into the church. We can't have a pious, better than them mindset. We can't be a church when they walk into our doors, they're saying, what? Why would I want that? There's more problems in the church than I have in my home. We have to be a church that has set its goal, set its course, set its focus, that is attractive to people that need a relationship with Christ and not only acceptance of their sin, but love them enough to help them through their sin, to love them, to encourage them, to give to them guidance of the Word of God, and to love them and to direct them and to mature them so they can see what Christ can do through them. Not a judgmental attitude, 
but an attitude that's going to allow people to see Christ. So in his book, I want to give you these real quick. And this is the average church that is 50 years old or older and is ready to die. It says this, the church refuses to look at the community. The community may have been dead around it. They refuse to look into the community. They only look at themselves. They look at the church. They don't think what I can do to minister to them. They look at what we can do for ourselves. The church has no community-focused ministries. The church has no impact into the community. They don't do anything outside of its four walls. Members have become more focused on the memorial of the past than they do the future. They look at what it was. They, they put plaques on the pews. They put pictures in the walls. They remember who dedicated this and who did, who did all the things. And they remember everything about the past. But they have no focus for the future. They like the memorial. And then the percentage of the budget for members' needs kept increasing. At the church's death, this church, 98% of the annual income of the church came in to satisfy the needs of the people in the pews. No outreach, no missions, no benevolence, just take care of who's already here. And if the church ever gets to the point that the majority of its budget is to take care of the people in the pews and not reach people for Jesus Christ, we are soon going to implode upon ourselves. And if we implode upon ourselves, there's no way that we can take care of outreach. There's no way that we can do missions. There's no way that we can reach this world for Jesus Christ. We must look at what is the purpose of our church, and it's to reach the lost and dying world. There were no evangelistic services or emphasis. We never preached on Jesus because we were afraid it would offend or we would think everybody's already saved. And you know what? The only thing that's going to change somebody's life it's not a good song, and it's not a good sermon. It's the power of Jesus Christ to forgive their sins. And we cannot be ashamed to proclaim the message of Jesus. We cannot be ashamed to talk about how Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sin, how he shed his blood for their sins, and how he changed their life because of their faith. There has to be a, a solid foundation of evangelism. And then members have to have, I want to say this right, the members had more about their arguments and about what they wanted compared to what God wanted. They cared more about their opinion than they cared about what God truly wanted for their church. And when a church becomes 50, 60 years of age, a lot of water under the bridge, a lot of successes and a lot of failures, a lot of hurts and a lot of joys, a lot of opinions. And you know what? It's just impossible to please everybody, isn't it? It is. And, you know, we try to and we want to. We want to minister to everybody. But at the same time, our goal, the foundation of this church is to proclaim the message of Jesus. To preach him high, preach him lifted up. The Bible says in the Old Testament, lift him up. And he, God, will draw all men unto Jesus. It didn't say lift up a song. It didn't say lift up a sermon. It didn't say lift up the drum or lift up the choir. He said lift up Jesus. And if we lift Jesus high, God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, will draw all men unto me. And then one of the things that the church quit doing when they turned 50 is they rarely pray. Oh, they pray in church. The pastor would pray. People from the pulpit would pray. But when they say prayer, that means the church. They got into people's lives and they prayed for each other. They knew the junk that there was going on in their life and they would pray and encourage and love and help and ministered to one another. So when you look at what God wants to do within our life, I believe there's some things that we should do. And let's look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. There are four simple things, and I want to share these rather rapidly, but there's four things that I believe, not look back to 1956 when Glenville was started. I want to look back in Acts chapter 2 when the church got started. Because I don't believe there's a greater mandate that God has given to us that when we start looking at how, what can we do as a church? What is it that we need to do? You know, and I want to say this. I don't want to take anything personal. And I don't want you to take anything personal. 
I don't want you to say, well, he's talking to me. I may be, but you know what? To talk to you, I have to talk to me. I have these issues as well. I have my opinions as well. You have your opinions as well. What we want to do is we want to take ourselves off of the altar block and put Jesus on the block and lift him high and lift up. Let's look at what the early church did, the things that they held on to. And if they held on to these things and God increased their numbers daily because they did these four simple things, I believe we as a church, we ought to take these, look at them, and apply them to our lives. So, Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Then fear, or you could use the word respect, came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as everyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and the breaking from house to house, they ate food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Daily, who was being saved. I think uh, the first thing we have to look at is God's church has to be steady. It has to be steadfast. When, when somebody walks in the door, they should know what we believe, what we're going to do. I believe that when somebody is hurting, when somebody is struggling, they need to know when they walk through these doors that they're going to get hope. They're going to get a foundation of strength. They're going to understand that the Word of God is going to be the vehicle in which we communicate. God's church is steady. I believe there's some areas that we need to be steady in. The first thing is teaching. I think we need to be steady in teaching. I think the teaching of the truth of the Word of God has to be important. We have to communicate the truth. We cannot and should not say, well, it is not favorable, or they are not going to like what I have to say, but we have to say, this is what the Bible says, and I'm going to communicate the truth of what the Bible says above everything else. I may be able to interject my opinion, but my opinion does not make a hill of bean difference, but what does is the truth of the Word of God. We have to be steady in our teaching, and then we have to have fellowship in, we have to be in common place. We have to be on task. The, the word fellowship means together, in common. We like each other. The word church, we come together. It's a, it's a place of worship. We come to this place to worship one Lord for a particular place. And this church is a, is a, is a cell group of a bigger church. And what we have to do is we have to say, this is mine. This is my house church. What I want to do is I want to honor God in everything that we do. We have to have things in common. If we become unsatisfied within our church, if we do not have the right direction, what we are saying is, God, I don't want you to bless me anymore. We have to have things in common. And they were, they were steadfast in the priorities of the church, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. They had communion together. Now, back in the day when, when a convert switched over from Judaism to Christianity, there's a lot of times that that convert would be excommunicated from their home and sometimes even lose their job. Christianity at that time was not necessarily a popular position. And when they were converted, they gave, they gave their life to Christ and they were baptized and they went home and they told mom and dad that they were converted to Christianity and they're going to follow after this Christian way of life. They would say, get out of my house. I am not going to support you anymore. You're not going to have what I have. So they were on their own. So when somebody converted to Christianity, and they came into the house of God, the house of God then becomes their family. And they have to minister to each other. They have to pray with each other. They have to give somebody else some job if somebody needed some food. They didn't have any other resources. So they came together. They had everything in common. When there was a need, the church family came together and met that need. We could look at it 
as if somebody was destitute and they were part of our church family. And there was something that was absolutely needed. They, there was no means of themselves. They didn't max out their credit cards and, and they just didn't spend wisely. They were just destitute. And they came in and they were absolutely without hope. And then we say, good luck. I hope everything's okay. If somebody was destitute, if somebody came in and they were in need, we as a church family have and we do minister to individuals on a daily basis. Now, just because they're late on the rent, because they went out and bought a 12-pack last night, every night for the last 32 days, and they can't pay the rent, I don't believe it's the job of the church to pay for the rent. Would you guys agree with that? But if somebody is hurting, if somebody is struggling, if somebody is destitute, we can come alongside them. And that's when the early church comes alongside people and helps them because of the priorities, the breaking of bread and prayer and love to everybody and cared for them. And then God's church is supposed to be a spirit-powered church. Not only are we supposed to be together and have things in common, not only are we supposed to be steady, but we have to be a spirit-powered church. Now, we as Baptists sometimes, we, we're scared of talking about the Spirit, but I love talking about the Holy Spirit, you know, because the Spirit of God does things that I can't do, and there's no problem talking about the triune Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does things that I can't do. The Holy Spirit utters the words that I can't say to God. He gives me direction in what I should do. He allows me to stay calm when I want to say something stupid. He gives me insight in what I need to do. He tells me and directs me what I should do. He allows the Holy Spirit, allows my heart to understand what God wants for me and directs my life, opens the doors, and gives me blessing. The Holy Spirit is the one that directed me to my salvation. The Holy Spirit broke my heart. The Holy Spirit opens my eyes. The Holy Spirit, my Lord, lives within my soul. He gives me direction. He gives me peace. He gives me comfort, and he gives me help. When I talk about the Holy Spirit, it's not something that I'm afraid of or I'm ashamed of. It's something that I'm in awe of. Because if I didn't have the Holy Spirit, let me even give you this. Jesus before he was ascended into heaven, he said, I am going to go, but I'm going to send one greater than myself to be with you. And the apostles were saying, greater than you? You, you? you just died on the cross. You just shed your blood. You were buried three days, and you conquered death. What in the, how could somebody... Be greater than you, Lord, because the Holy Spirit is in all of us. He's in your soul. He's in mine. The same direction that I get from the Holy Spirit is the same direction you get from the Holy Spirit. He is one God living in our hearts, giving us direction. So when we have an issue, when we have a problem, when we do not agree, we have the power of God living in the residence within our soul to have communion with one another. It is when we say, I don't care what God wants. I don't care what the Holy Spirit's directing me to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. We flip off the power of the Holy Spirit within our life. We reject his calling, his prompting within our life. And then we live in the flesh because we said no to the Spirit. And in Galatians chapter 5, it gives this whole discourse about leave, following after the flesh instead of following after the Spirit. And when we want to follow after God and follow him, he does great and mighty things for us. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. The Holy Spirit's power is the direction. We ought to ask God directly 
for that power of God to work within our life. His Spirit powered as a church. We cannot be afraid to say, Lord, I need your power. I need to be following the power of the Holy Spirit. I want God to work within me in a mighty way. So not only do we have to understand God's Spirit, but we also uh, see that God's church is unselfish. Unselfish. Now, we, we look at a lot of different things about what the Scripture says here about, about being selfish and unselfish, but what, uh, what it's talking about is they stayed together, they shared together, and they saw the needs together. When we're selfish, we think about ourselves. When we're unselfish, we think about others. When we're unselfish, when we start looking at the needs of others, they have a priority within our life. We start seeing and we start feeling, we start having empathy for what they go through. Now, we cannot enable everybody. We cannot allow everybody to, be, to use us. But what we can do is through the power of the Holy Spirit, is saying, God, I need you to direct me. If, if, if I have this $100 that I don't need necessarily, I like it, I want it, but I have $100 at the end of the week, and uh, I want to I do something for you. You know, if you advertise $100 for free over your door, you're going to have a few people come in trying to get 100 bucks, right? But if you say, Lord, I want you to supernaturally direct me to someone that's in need. Not someone that's going to ask for it, but that somebody that's in need. You know what the Holy Spirit does? He opens doors and sees what others need. And he directs your soul and directs your heart. But what we have to do is we have to be willing to say, mine is not mine. Mine is God's. I can be who I need to be, but I have to have the resources to say, whatever you want me to do, I can't be selfish in my money. I'm going to preach here for about two minutes. I can't be selfish in my attitude, in my wants, in my tastes. If we're going to be a church that's going to move into the future, we are going to have to have things in common. We're going to have to have a purpose in front of us. We're going to have to ask God to say, you know what? We started back in 1956, and those were great days. And the Lord has blessed us for 58 years. Praise God for that. But you know what I would rather do with those 58 years? I'd rather learn from them, but not live in them. Okay? I thank God for what he has done. I love what he has done. But that era, that time frame, that methodology was great. It was successful. It took us to where we are now. But if we try to live in 2014, as J.J. Adrian did in 1956, we are going to lose the power of God because the people need a fresh anointing and how we get that fresh anointing is we must look at this world from a different perspective. If most of the churches that are over 50 years old are dying, they're dying. How, how can we get missionaries on the mission field if our churches are declining? How do, how do we spread the gospel in Wichita if it's our churches are dead? How, how do we share the gospel about salvation if we're afraid to preach about Jesus? How are we going to change the world if we are afraid to proclaim the message? We can't worry about what they think. What we must do is worry, number one, what does God want for us? We can't be embarrassed. We can't be selfish. What we have to do is say, thank you for where we have been. Thank you for that. We have to be in one accord. We have to walk on the same path. And we may not agree on the methodology of everything that we do. And I don't, ex I don't expect to, I don't agree with half the stuff I do. <laughs> I just fight with myself half the time. But I, I want to have a pure heart. And I want to move. 
I don't, I don't want to wake up 10 years from now being the pastor of this church and the church waking up all of a sudden we're in a declined state. We're not growing. We're not winning souls. We're not doing anything for the cause of Christ, but we're satisfied because we're content because we're at the state that we can pay our bills and we can fill up our chairs and we can proclaim the message and we can sing a few songs. I believe that is not God's intention for the church. I believe the church has to be much bigger than Sunday morning. I believe the church has to be this, that every person that radically comes through these doors, they are automatically put into assimilation, ministry, and reproduction. You come through these doors not to be entertained. You come through these doors to serve so others can see Jesus Christ. And if we ever want to be a church that's going to grow into the future, we are not a church of entertainers, and we're not here for entertainment. We're here to evangelize and for evangelism. If we have that mindset, we can be self-focused. But if evangelism is not the problem, if the problem that we have is I don't like this or I don't like that or somebody doesn't like this, we become so discouraged because different opinions and various ideas, we get so caught up in paying everybody's attention that we say, okay, I'm going to put out fires today. I'm going to make everybody's phone call to make everybody happy today. So we're not talking about Jesus. We're talking about fires. We're not talking about doing what God wants us to do because all we're trying to do is keep everybody happy. And you know what? Keeping people happy don't put anybody in the baptismal tank. And, you know, and if we don't win people for Jesus, Jesus isn't happy. And if all we're doing is filling up the chairs for more people to complain, but we're not evangelizing the Wichita are we doing what God wants us to do? If all we're doing is taking members from another church that they didn't like that church, but yet now they're at this church, but yet we didn't change them for Jesus, all we're doing is giving them some different type of food. But we didn't change the world. We didn't impact anybody for the cause of Christ because we're not doing what God wants us to do. I believe every person that walks in these doors. Every person that says, I want Glenville to be my home. Okay, everybody put your seatbelt on for a second because you're not going to like this one. Everyone. Glenville is not here for entertainment. Glenville is not here to make you happy. Glenville is here to honor Jesus. Glenville is here you are a member here, not to sit in the chair. You're a member here for this chair to be here on Sunday morning to get you motivated, to teach you, to go out and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It, it, is, it, is, unbelievable. it is unbelievable to me how we can come to church on Sunday morning. I've been here for 15 years. We come to church every Sunday morning and hear the simple plan of salvation of Jesus Christ. And we see people getting saved. We see people getting baptized. We see life change in individuals' lives. But that message that, ha that takes place here on Sunday morning, that message needs to get into other people's lives. That message of what God has done for you, how he brought your marriage together, how he radically changed your addictions, how he saved you, how he took you and he gave you a peace of heart and peace of mind. It's not about Glenville. It's what God has used in this place to take people outside of this place that is dying and going to hell and you have the simple message. Our job is to go on mission and to get out of these doors. Every member goes on mission to share what Jesus has done for them. Churches that are dead and churches that are declining, set in the chairs. Applause the preacher. Walk out the door and go to lunch. Never to change anyone's life. That is a dead church. We could be full. We could pay our bills. 
But a healthy church, a church of impact, is not about the numbers. It's about the product. And the product is, I am going to change people's life. So the last thing is God's church was, and it needs to be a unified church. A unified church. What are we doing? If I could, many of you have been here for a long time, many of you are new. I, if I would ask you, what is Glenville here for? What is the purpose of the church? What is the purpose of Glenville? Ah, oh, it's to hear the preacher. It's to be, hear the singing. It's to come to church on Sunday morning. Oh, they have a good youth program, or they have a good children's program, or they have a soccer program, or they go to camp. Whoa, whoa, whoa. All those things are good. But those are just simple symptoms of what the purpose of the church is. And if Glenville is not known that they change, they radically change, they bring people to a walk and a relationship with Christ, we are not fulfilling our purpose. We should be unified in the direction that I have an opportunity that I can take people outside of God, bring them into a family of God, I can reproduce who I am with them, and they can see Christ within my life. Now, here's what, here's what God wants us to do. There's four simple, five simple things. First thing, help people from lost to found. Help people from lost to found. That's membership. Help people that were lost, now they found Christ. Now they know that Jesus died on the cross. Now they come into the church and they're saved. They are blood-bought saint of God. They're going to heaven. They are saved. You brought them from lost to found. Bring them into membership. And then mature every believer. That's what Pastor Al is in charge of, is our discipleship. Grow every believer. Every believer. I... I, I don't believe there should ever be a member of our church that is not a growing member. Not everybody's going to be at the same place. Not everybody's going to know everything about the Bible. But everybody should be growing. Everybody should be learning. Everybody should be praying. If, if we go from one Sunday to two Sundays and you didn't pray or you didn't read the Bible or you didn't study one little thing, you know what I would say? I would say you're a babe in Christ. You desire the milk, but not the sincere meat. You don't desire the growth. And if we only drink the milk of the word, we will never grow. And Satan will be able to toss you to and fro all over the place because you have no principle of what the Bible truly wants for you. So you hear whatever you want to hear. You do whatever you want to do because you do not have absolute truth. But we need to grow and we need to be mature. Then every Christian has ministry. Every Christian has ministry. If the church is going to learn from the early church, they were ministers. They did ministry. Not some of them, not just the disciples. They all did what they needed to do. I believe every Christian, every member of the church should be found doing something within the body of Christ. We're all gifted. We should all serve. And then every Christian involved in mission work, in mission work, whether it's a local mission project or a foreign mission project, whether it's giving some resources or doing something for the cause of Christ, every person not only should be ministering, but should be involved in a mission, involved in something greater than ourselves. When we talk about our mission statement, to, to impact people around the world and in our local assembly, what we must do is we must be a proclaimer of the message. And then Christians should evangelize. That's our mandate. It's hard to do. But what it is, is we need to learn how to share your faith. How to lead somebody to the Lord. The saddest thing about a church, 55, 56, 60-year-old church, is I could ask in a typical congregation, how many of you have led somebody to the Lord this year, just this year. In a church of 600 people, I would probably say there'd probably be 20, maybe 15 people that raise their hand and say, yeah, 
I led somebody to the Lord. Where it should be, we should have somebody on our hearts, in our minds, in our actions, saying, you know what? I break for that individual. That person needs Christ. Jesus saved me. He has forgiven me. He has given to me an eternal destination, and I am totally satisfied where I am spiritually, but yet we don't give that out to somebody else in need. I believe we can look back for the last 58 years, and J.J. Adrian had a little slogan. He said, soul winning and missions is the right arm of the church. In other words, everything that we do Everything this church is going to be about is going to be about soul winning and missions. We don't hear that word soul winning very often, do we? Change it to evangelism. Soul winning is just, I want to win somebody to Jesus. I want somebody that does not have a relationship with Christ. I want to give them the opportunity to see Christ. Soul winning and missions is the right arm, lifeblood, the strength of the church. And when a church loses that strength, soul winning and missions. What happens? We become stagnant. What happens? We start declining. What happens? We die. We die. Now the church, oh, we can always have people here. You can get a band up here and you can get a guy that can say a few words and do a few draw. You, you, you'll get some people here. There'll always be a crowd of people at Glenville. I don't want a crowd of people. I want God to radically motivate us to think God's way, do what he wants us to do, to change people's lives. So when we bring people up here that have done great and mighty things that God has radically changed their life and that life change has taken place, it inspires us to do something great. We want to be a church for the next 50 years that's continuing to change people's lives. Full, half full, empty, it's our choice. I want each and every one of us to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Who am I going to reach? How can I make an impact? Who can I bring tomorrow? Who can sit beside me Sunday? And you know, what the funny thing is, you, most of the times you could care less what I preach on. Unless the person that you're working with all week long that has been struggling with all kinds of addictions, have all kinds of major issues, and they're sitting right beside you. You prayed about that Sunday. And you, oh, Bruce, please don't say anything stupid. Don't, 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 don't. Because you care because the person that you love and you prayed for sitting right beside you, you're saying, Bruce, please hit. Please talk about Jesus. Please talk about how God can forgive their sins. Please talk about how God rescued them, how God took care of you and how he could take care of them. You care when somebody beside you is in need. I ask you to care enough to put somebody beside you so you will care enough to pray. I guarantee you, the church of impact would be a church that cares. And a church that cares is a church that loves. And we love enough to bring people with us that need Jesus. The lifeblood the flowing lifeblood of a church, what it makes it breathe, how it grows, how it lives. This church in 1956 was soul winning and missions. I believe these four little principles can take us to a place that we need to be unified, we need to be focused, we have to have undefined love one for another, common ground that we know where we're going and why we're trying to get there and it's not about the opinions of everybody it's about what does god want for us to do let's not major on the minors but major on the thing preach
proclaim the message of what's his name? Jesus. That's it. Proclaim the name of Jesus. You love the verse. I say it all the time. Because at the name of Jesus, what's going to happen? Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Everyone, whether it's here or whether it's at the throne of God, my job is to get you, your family, and your friends to bend their knee at Jesus when he is their Savior, when he can say, come into paradise. But if we don't get them to bend their knee down here and they stand to the judgment of God, they're going to bend their knee before him and he will then be their judge. And then he's going to say something you don't want your friends to hear. Sorry. I, I don't know you. You'll bend your knee. You'll say, you're Lord. He goes, I was your Lord forever. I brought you to church. I remember sitting right beside that ugly guy in the green shirt with the beard, and, and he invited me to church. But you know what? You didn't hear. I remember you. But you didn't say yes. You rejected me. So I have to reject you. He's our Savior. He will be our judge. But we will bend our knee. We truly will. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we thank you for the church, where we came from, a product of the 50s, 58 years. Lord, you have blessed our church, and we have a church. We have tried to mess you up, make our mistakes. We have hurt you, and we've hurt the reputation of your work many times. But you have always been faithful. You've always forgiven us us individually, and us as a church. And Lord, we thank you for allowing us these 58 years. And Lord, I ask you to instill within a heart of our church a heart of unity, a heart of love, a heart of unselfishness, so we can have some common ground. Lord, that we can be steady. Steady moving into the future. That when somebody needs God, they come to us. Because they know that we're going to give them the life-changing message of Jesus. Lord, direct our paths. Let us never become the stat. 80% of the church stagnated or declining. Lord, allow us the power Allow us the ability to reach into people's lives, to change, to help, to love, and to encourage them. We ask you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.